Hello, uh, this is the talk Linux Gaming in 2020, preparing the Linux kernel to emulate modern Windows games. Uh, my name is Gabriel, I work for Collabora, and uh, I'm part of a larger project to improve the experience of gaming on Linux. Uh, since game is quite a broad topic and it gathers a lot of attention, I should make clear that I'm, I'm giving my personal opinion on some topics and I will be exposing some ongoing kernel work that we're doing to improve gaming in Linux. Yeah. But first of all, let's look a bit at the picture of what games are in Linux today, how they look like. We have basically two sorts of games running around. We have the open source games and the proprietary. And from a development perspective, from a, an operating systems engineer perspective, uh, open source games are the easy kind. We can just rebuild them, fix bigs, and adapt them, and develop them in a programming model that really fits the way that Linux is taught, the way that we usually develop software for Linux. But then there is the proprietary realm, where there are games where the studios dedicate some resources to running them on Linux, and the other scenario most common and very famous games where the studio simply doesn't care about Linux at all. They write their game for a specific platform, in most cases Windows, sometimes for Mac OS, and they just publish it for, that, for them. And we are left behind. So it's, uh, this is the scenario we have today, and uh, this talk will be obviously focusing more on these specific Windows-only games and, and the work we are doing to bring them to Linux. Uh, basically, games are in a different, in a special category of software in the way that they, it's hard to make open source games, and most of the games famous today, they are proprietary applications with very little support from gaming studios to bring them to Linux. Uh, so recompiling them and modifying them to fit a window, a Linux development perspective is a bit out of the picture. They are also uh, exceptional in the sense that they carry a lot of locks, both for DRM, which is more common in other kinds of application, and then to cheating mechanisms, which are mechanisms to prevent you from just cheating on the game and making it not fun for everyone else. So they implement a lot of features to prevent into cheating that sometimes get in the way of our reverse engineering or our work to bring them to another platform. As I mentioned, they are mostly coded for other platforms, in particular for Windows, who always reigned over this specific area of the market. And with the long goal of bringing gaming to Linux, uh, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. If we had people gaming on Linux and huge chunks of the, huge chunks of the market gaming on Linux, maybe we could be able to attract more attention to Linux as a platform for gaming development and game playing. But uh, we need to increase developers' interest. We need to make the platform more attractive for them. And by making it more attractive, it includes also bringing users. So uh, we have a way to circumvent this problem and bring the, all this gaming ecosystem from Windows into Linux through emulation, through compatibility layers, and sometimes through some kind of uh, reverse engineering. So the approach that uh, Valve in particular took back in 2018 was to start this abstraction layer called Proton. That was basically a compatibility tool. tool. Uh, and a big piece of it is Wine. There is, it's not a, a new technology. Wine has been there for a long time, but Proton brought together Wine with several other technologies to make this, to make running a game over Wine, over wine more uh, effectively, effective and easier for the end user. And this Proton, is, this Proton Tunis has been maintained since 2018 by Valve in an open source fashion with support from developers all around the world. Uh, basically, Proton looks like this. It includes a bunch of libraries, Wine in particular, and it's the, it's the primary mechanism to start a game through the uh, Steam client uh, 
uh, it's gonna use Proton to, la to launch a Windows only game and run it over Linux under these compatibility layers. It's gonna configure a lot of stuff, uh, set up the Wine environment and launch the game through Wine. Uh, one detail is that the game and Wine, Wine then is gonna execute the game in this compatibility mode, in this um, sandbox like environment, not exactly a sandbox, but Wine then. Behave, performs as a compatibility layer. Uh, and as I mentioned, Wine is the big piece in that. It's not a security sandbox. A Windows application runs into exactly the same uh, protected space as the as the as Wine itself. One important detail there is that Wine doesn't do any kind of virtualization. There is no. Um, it's not a it's not a mean it's not a matter of virtual machines here. Uh, Wine and the Windows application they run on the same uh, process as part different parts of the same process. And what Wine does is quite simple. It exposes the APIs and the ABI that a Windows application is using. Why is say ABI and API? Well, it exposes the ABI for the program, but it also it in it does that by implementing the API that uh, Windows applications expect to use. And that API, it reflects a lot on how a program is developed for a specific interface. We're going to be discussing more on that later. Just a small comment is that uh, Wine is also community developed and uh, it has major contributions by Valve and Code Weavers. And I, I would like to send kudos to those guys because they really helped us on the development that we are doing that I'm going to be discussing here today. Um, my point about the difference in the ecosystems is that when you run a Windows program, it's talking mostly to the Win API. And the way that you develop the Windows program is based on the assumptions made by that API on what it provides you. Same thing when you're developing something for Linux. When we say that Linux is a POSIX-like operating system, it means that applications running over Linux have a set of expectations of how the operating system behaves. And it's not a matter of system calls, it's more a matter of libraries, what is exposed to you. So the way that you program, the way that you think a problem for Linux is a bit different than the way that you, that you program, that you solve a problem in Windows. And that is mostly how the, what the API exposes to you. So when you write a program for Windows, you use the Win API. And when you run that over Wine, Wine is basically a mechanism to translate that semantics into Linux terms, into Linux libraries and the Linux kernel. So it's going to implement that functionality of the Windows ABI into, uh, into something that can be executed by Linux. And one important detail there is the more different the Windows API, ABI is from the, the Linux ABI, API, sorry, the bigger the work that Wine needs to do. If they were very similar, Wine would be just a quick translator that could execute that. But when you need, when you have very different interfaces, Wine needs to do a lot of heavy lifting to emulate those interfaces, and that results in increased overhead. Uh, so the effort that we uh, at Collabora, in, in my team, in the kernel team, have been doing with uh, with respect to gaming on Linux is mostly identify pain points for Wine to emulate Windows interfaces with the current kernel. Basically, we look at Wine and see where the overhead is and what interfaces Wine would benefit from if they were supported in the kernel. Uh, this doesn't mean that we are implementing the Win API or any Windows syscall in the kernel. On the contrary. It means that we are trying to we solve in the kernel things that are harder to solve in user space, always adequating them to a Linux design. So we take specific problems that are not resolvable in user space or in a compatibility layer and try to solve them in the kernel space. And the reason they might not be solvable in kernel space is usually performance, or sometimes, as in the file system example I'm going to give, uh, correctness. It's not possible. The Linux uh, interface doesn't expose a mechanism to do a specific thing race-free or it doesn't export that functionality at all. And this is where we try to extend Linux. Uh, 
The first pain point that I would like to discuss is something that arose in file systems and how Windows and Linux file systems diverge in some semantics. Uh, so the issue at hand is that you, uh, historically Windows exposed their file systems as case insensitive while Windows, Windows does them in a case sensitive fashion. And case insensitivity basically means that any of the files that you can see in the, in the gray box in the right, they are resolved to the same file no matter the case. So it basically exposes the file system in a manner where case of words doesn't make, doesn't make a difference. That is a very interesting approach for human beings because we don't usually think in a matter of case, but it's more complex for applications, for operating systems and file systems in particular, since now there are different ways, uh, bytewise, to refer to a specific file. Linux has never dealt with that problem because most of native, in fact, most uh, native Unix file systems before Linux they always dealt with file systems, uh, sorry, they always dealt with file names as if they were an opaque byte sequence, basically just a sequence of bytes that doesn't have any lexical meaning. Uh, but when we are bringing uh, a game to run over a compatibility mode, uh, that game usually, usually relies on this behavior, which means that the game might try to access a file with many possible cases, and when it is operating over a Linux uh, file system on a compatibility mode, that file with a different case will not exist and the game will eventually crash. So what we've done until today is Wine had to emulate, capture every access to a file coming from the Windows side of the program and emulate it through to figure out what exactly the case was in Linux and then open that specific file. That kind of emulation is costly, in particular for large directories, because it requires Wine to cache a lot of information and directories change, files get added and removed. And that overhead started to count on our performance measurement of games, which means that at some point, uh, games were running slower because Wine had to do all this work without any assistance from the file system. And it's not just a matter of saying, okay, let's, for people running games, let's use XFAT or some other file system coming from the Windows world that is case sens insensitive by default, because Proton doesn't choose your file system, but usually your distribution does or you choose yourself and you don't change it afterwards. So when we are dealing with this kind of pro problem, my first approach is let's not change the kernel. Let's see if we can solve that in user space. So we basically took the Wine implementation and redid it in a different way. We tried a lot of caching. We used uh, notification mechanisms provided by Linux kernel to track all this information. And we came to a fully future uh, user space implementation of this. It was not fuse dependent, it had some uh, syscall interception mechanism, but it has inherent performance problems. Uh, there is no way to solve that unless you can write uh, metadata information to the disk that allows you to retrieve a file independent of the case, and that requires modifying the file system. In addition, it has some unsolvable race conditions. For instance, when you are accessing, looking for a file and someone else removes it, file that you really needs to be the kernel to, to figure out. And that at some point started to crash games. So the only right solution for this is doing it in the kernel, which might seem unfortunate for some people, but is the only way forward. So we started developing in 2017, 2018, a native case insensitive support for selected Linux file systems. And by selected, I mean the file systems that are more, most common in distributions. We started with, with ext4. Now there is f2fs, which is a file, a file system very important for Android. Uh, and uh, we have current work, on, we have ongoing work for butterfs, for xfs and other file systems. And that implementation, uh, it solved all the pain points that we had. It's much more performant because we can modify the disk uh, 
to store that kind of information. It's also correct because we have the same semantics of, uh, of, of VFS operations in Linux. So one interesting thing about this work is that it received, it received some small backslash from the development community, which was expected uh, since Linux always, always did things the other way, uh, in a case sensitive fashion. But we found out that there were more users out there. And when we started developing it, the Android folks came and said, hey, we have the same problem with Android because Android also publishes, also exposes parts of its, of its file system in a case insensitive manner. So this work uh, that we started for a gaming uh, interest to solve gaming specific issues got applied to other parts of the, of the Linux ecosystem. And this is what this talk is all about, is how we develop these features on games and eventually they are useful for other people. Uh, I said that it had a small backslash from the development community, but it had a much bigger backslash from user community. People screaming, don't break my system. And for that reason, I prepared a very small uh, FAQ, actually uh, an FQA, Frequent Questions Answered, regarding this feature, which is quite controversial in some circles. Uh, case insensitive is supported natively in the XT4 since Linux 5.4. And it's not a feature that is uh, either always on or always off. It's an, op optionally it's an optional feature that can be enabled on a per directory basis. It will never be a default setting, is not something that you want to configure on the root of your file system. And the reason for that is even if you try to do that, uh, we made sure to make that it doesn't work because just looking at a, a generic Linux file system, you can find stuff in slash user slash lib that collide in file name deferring only by case. So this is something that should never be used on the root of your file system if you don't have a very, very good reason to do so and you know what you're doing. It's something that you should use on a very, on a specific directory inside of your home, where your games are set, where you really have a use case for that. Uh, on the case of uh, Steam, I believe Steam would configure that directory for a game when it downloads it or something like that. Um, and it's safe. It only applies to those specific directories. The rest of your, your system continues to be to work as a, in a case in, in a case sensitive fashion. Uh, the reason for that is that all the other programs in your system expect your file system to be case sensitive, and we care a lot about not breaking stuff. So we made sure it would work in a way that is safe for people. But it requires some distro support to be enabled. It requires the kernel to support the feature. Uh, at build time, it requires a specific flag to be set on your disk, declaring that the disk supports that functionality. And it requires an update, up-to-date version of E2FS progs if you're using EXT4 or uh, the corresponding uh, programs in another file system. And the problem is many distros still don't enable config Unicode and they also don't enable encoding installation. And I just want to make sure that people know that enabling that configuration and enabling the feature disk wide doesn't make your system go crazy. It still requires per directory configuration. And actually I expect in the future that more and more distros are going to be adopting that configuration by default because we make a lot of effort to make sure it works and it would be a shame for it to go unused. And it can go unused. Um, for instance, Wine we will always have the fallback mode where it tries to do case insensitive in user space, uh, either for older kernel, kernels or for any other reason. And there is a performance hit on that, but it's, it, there's still this compatibility mode. So in the case insensitive feature, there is some things that are desired, uh, wanted features and that my team is still working on. The first one of that is improving FSCK support. So we can guarantee that any problem that arises in a case insensitive disk, uh, disk whether or not it's related to case insensitivity, it's fixable. 
This is not something specific to case insensitive. Every file system can be corrupted at any time and we always have features to fix that. We are also pushing more distros to adopt it such that people installing uh, Steam on any distro can benefit from those things. And like I said, we, are, we have work on going to support uh, case insensitivity in more file systems with the same semantics such that uh, other users can also benefit from this feature without relying, without falling back, falling back into the wine uh, emulation user space gaming sensitivity. A second pain point that was brought to us by the wine developers is related to thread synchronization and how it's done in Linux. Uh, it's quite a complex problem, but uh, an easy way to understand it is looking at this didactic example, which is not necessarily a real use case. But in this scenario, we have uh, multiple producers and multiple consumers, but there is a relation where for each producer, there is only a subset of the consumers that can consume the data from that producer. So for each producer, for each consumer, we want to maximize its usage, its ability. So it needs to be able to consume something from the producer as soon as, soon as it's done. And we don't want it to be waiting for a producer while a different producer, where the different producer is ready. Uh, but since not all producers can be consumed by all waiters, and different, and the same producer can can be consumed by different waiters, uh, there is a challenge in modeling it. Uh, we observe that uh, there are ways to model it in user space or model it using existing interfaces in the Linux kernel. But uh, Wine developers and game developers started to observe that that was also becoming a performance issue for games running over Wine. So they asked us and started to looking for an approach. Uh, and basically that problem arises specifically in a game scenario because games are obviously very thread heavy and there is a lot of communication between threads. And the fact is Windows has a very convenient API to handle with that kind of things, which is called uh, wait for multiple objects. It, uh, it's designed to allow a program to specify a list of uh, scenarios where that, uh, that thread is going to be awakened. It can be awakened by a mutex changing state, it can be awakened by a signal, by an event, by a different thread, by a condition variable, by anything. And it can specify a list of these things. Uh, in Linux, what we can do is we can pull, we can pull on, a, on a pipe, on a socket and wait for data coming from that socket. We can uh, use eventfd for that and pull on several eventfds, one for each thread, or we can try to write a dispatcher in user space that wait on a single condition and every time that condition is triggered for any thread, we can dispatch it to the right thread. We experimented with all of these things and we observed the issues with each and every one of them. For instance, the eSync implementation, which is used nowadays by Proton users, it's based on pulling on the EventFD interface. And the fact is, EventFD fits the problem quite well. You can, and pulling on it is a, is a good solution. But there are a few problems there. The first is that file descriptors is a limited resource and we hit it very easily with, with games and multiple objects. And there is a cost associated with the sleeping and wake up of, uh, of pooling that started to become a bottleneck and appear on our benchmarks. And that in particular, and we were able to observe in particular heavy CPU usage for threads that were just sleeping on it. And EventFD also has a problem that it requires us to always go in the kernel. So unlike few taxes, it doesn't have a fast path that, avoid, that let us avoid going to the kernel if the object is just ready there for us. Uh, we experimented with optimizing EventFD, but we learned it was quite a challenge. Uh, and then there is obviously the other solution I mentioned that is bring all of these and do a dispatcher in user space. 
and we can re we can model this in a very simple way. Put all your uh, wait, put all your events under a single condition variable, and whenever that variable is tricked, any uh, any producer that is ready triggers that thread, triggers that variable that is going to run the dispatcher thread that selects the correct waiter to wake up. That is a common model for parallel programming programmers, but it has some limitations in the sense that it has a lot of spurious awakes. We are going to be waking dispatchers to wake a different, to wake a, the actual job worker. And that also uh, showed on our benchmarks. The fact is when we're dealing with, um, appli with applications like games, every performance change is observed in frame per seconds and very visible to users to gamers and we try to look for a better solution on that that would make this problem really go away uh, and the solution came as a suggestion by uh, Zebediah Figuera which is a who is a developer at Wine and he proposed a new few text operation to model exactly this kind of pro program uh, it doesn't completely emulate the wait for multiple objects in the kernel because wait for multiple objects can wait on several kinds of objects and here we are proposing that we pass a list of few taxes to the kernel and wait on, the, on that list and any of those few taxes will trigger the sleeping thread. That makes all the emulation on user space much easier because now we can treat every different object as a different thread assign a few texts to each of them, and then the problem can be well resolved in kernel space. And then we are reusing all the genius behind few texts, which allow us to avoid the kernel in the uncontended case. And, and they prove it to show very good performance. It's implemented by the kernel support that we published uh, on the kernel mailing list and on a test kernel for gamers. Uh, it's a Ubuntu-based kernel that has the patches. And we published a version of Proton that has a module called F-Sync that is capable of using that new interface. And well, the interface itself, it received very positive feedback from the kernel community. The use case that we were presenting is very well understood and is known to be a current issue in the kernel. There were suggestions in the past to solve this issue. The fact is that uh, when we submitted those patches, we uncovered a bit of, uh, of a lot of old issues, in particular with the Futex kernel code, which had maintainability issues, complexity issues, and a lot of people were trying to merge new features on that kernel, on that feature, and uh, it wasn't well received by the maintainers. So the community decided that it was a moment to rewrite the Futex interface. And then we took this effort and started to design the new interface with the help of the community. And as a result, uh, the result of that work is a Futex 2, which uh, I think there, there is another talk on this conference discussing that specifically. Uh, like case insensitive, there were developer feedback and user feedback. And user feedback in this in this example, they were very positive. So uh, one of the Valve developers published uh, a request on GitHub for people to share the results using F-Sync with the test kernels that we distributed for Ubuntu, for Liquorix, and for several other test kernels. And the results were incredible. We had result. We have people reporting from five to 200 to 300% improvement in frames per second in different games. And I can say as a personal example that I have at least one game that was really unplayable in my system that now runs really well. I don't know if I can say the name of the game. But what does that mean? Does that mean that Linux is worse for threading than Linux? Absolutely not. It means that the programming model that was used to design that game doesn't fit the Windows, the Linux uh, programming ecosystem, the Linux APIs. So we are extending it to better support it. Uh, 
just a few comments on the new interface that we are proposing. Futex 2 doesn't solve only the vectored version of Futex, the multiple object version of Futex. It solves several long-standing points on Futex for the kernel community. It brings all the new features that a lot of people were expecting. It's a very valuable contribution to the kernel itself. It's, uh, it brings new awareness, variable size of Futexes, all the stuff that people were really rooting to have in the Futex code. We are trying to bring that now to the kernel. Uh, and it also has, uh, since we're designing it from scratch, we, it also allows us to convert the weight multiple code into a better design that, uh, we, are, that we are working on. And uh, since it's a new implementation, we can just design it in something that will benefit from vectored few taxes from the start. And uh, I still don't have numbers, but from what I, what I hear, we have very promising results. And my expectation is that we might have better performance numbers for games than we have with uh, few tech weight multiple. I'm hoping for that, but I still don't have the numbers to back it. Whether that will show in benchmarks or not is something that still needs to be seen. Finally, the third pain point that I, that I want to discuss today is a Cisco emulation, which is the topic of my previous talk that I think went yesterday at the time of the conference. And this is a problem of correctness for games running over uh, Linux uh, through Wine. Basically, the problem is that now modern game uh, DRM and anti-cheating technologies, they are issuing system calls directly from the game Windows game code. And that bypasses Wine because Wine is not a sandbox. Wine is not a virtual machine. It's simply a library that gets linked to your program. So Wine is not able to capture those system calls. And once that system call coming from the Windows code reaches the kernel, uh, and that system call has parameters and arguments uh, as it was a Windows kernel running, the game is definitely going to crash. Uh, once again, like we always did, we try first to find a user space solution uh, because that is simpler, it avoids uh, tinkering with the kernel and it's, well, it's definitely simpler. And the solutions that we attempt, which involved SIGHOMP and dynamically rewriting system calls, they had their own issues with uh, anti-cheating software. We cannot modify a game binary without triggering all the codes to prevent it from being modified for piracy and cheating. So we cannot touch that part. And they also affected performance. Like I mentioned, any attempt to emulate will introduce a performance overhead in your gaming experience. So the right solution, once again, was let's go back into the kernel. And then we developed this whole new mechanism designed specific for emulation of uh, gaming system calls that are integrated into the Linux kernel. It's called a Cisco User Dispatch. It integrates very well with Secomp and other modes that already exist in the kernel. And it's designed for emulation, so it's really fast for syscalls that are dispatched natively. So it's very fast for a hybrid environment where you have native syscalls coming from Wine and emulate, uh, emulated syscalls from, from the Windows application. Uh, this is still a work in progress like the Futex stuff, but uh, it's expected to land really soon. I was hoping to have it in 5.10, but uh, most likely it will, it will land only on 5.11. And the adoption for it, for it is going to be very simple. You just have your distro enabling the config option and we will make sure distros are enabling that because it's very um, it's a very isolated feature that doesn't affect the rest of the system. So there is no reason to not do it. And from then you just use a Proton version uh, new enough. I'm not going to go deep into this uh, item because I just gave a talk about it yesterday or maybe tomorrow. I'm confused with the schedule and this is all pre-recorded. But um, yeah, basically I'm not going to go deep into this feature, just watch the other talk. Uh, there are a few other pain points that we've been working on with, uh, with our customer to improve gaming experience in, in Linux. Uh, we work it on device the device bring up. We work it on um, uh, solving some file system issues, 
improving performance in other areas of the system. We have a team looking at uh, some scheduling stuff that we maybe can optimize in future kernel releases. So it's a very long uh, ongoing work that is already bringing uh, very good results for gamers uh, using Linux as their platform of choice. Uh, a few takeaways of this talk is that uh, we are not in any way trying to bring the Windows world into Linux. We are trying to ease emulation and only extend kernel and uh, user space libraries when really necessary. We try to make our designs that are useful for other people on the Linux ecosystem. In particular, the field text approach is something that's going to benefit a lot of people. And, uh, well, we are seeing a lot of good results with all this work and hopefully they will reflect in a better gaming experience measured in frames per second as a final metric in several cases for uh, end users. And uh, what we'll, that's what we'll keep doing. We will continue to make Linux support more and more games, both natively and emulated. Uh, as a personal wish, I would love to see more open source games who don't rely on, on most of this, uh, these workarounds, these emulating efforts, but this is, uh, this is in the future, hopefully. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge a few uh, companies and people who made, who have been sponsoring this work. So in particular Valve and uh, one of their employees at Yardoop who have been sponsoring a work and supporting it in technical and uh, and all sorts of support for this work. Uh, also thank uh, the Wine developer Zebediah and uh, Paul for their valuable uh, design ideas and a lot of technical input in all of the works that I presented here today. Uh, thank you. I'm asked to mention that if you'd like to work on the, making the Linux ecosystem better for gaming and a lot of different interesting projects, Collabora is always hiring and I'll probably be taking questions during the talk, so thank you.